going to work. And um, so welcome to our Racism and Irish Education panel, panel discussion, which is organised by the HIT in association with the wonderful Afro-Caribbean Society. It's a collaboration for our Freshers Week um, set of events. And I think this is one of the most important and most interesting discussions we have on during this week. Essentially, what's going to happen is we're going to ask lots of questions to our wonderful different panelists. Um, this panel features um, wonderful academics such as Dr. Yvonne Joseph, uh, Gillian Wiley, uh, Claudia Haro, and the wonderful Florence Nwaje. So we're really excited to talk to all of them about everything that we're going to get, uh, go through about racism in Irish education. Um, and then we're going to leave at least 15 minutes at the end um, for audience questions. So anyone who's interested in discussing um, anything or asking any of our panelists questions based on our, our topic for today, just pop it in the chat. Um, just to introduce the HIST as well, um, uh, we are functionally a debating society, um, which means that we're very interested in all kinds of important topics. And um, this, this, um, this panel is a, a step towards making our society and, and uh, by extension, our entire campus and our institution of Trinity College Dublin more inclusive, diverse and accessible for, all, for everyone. Um, and I'd just like to hand it over to, to Lixon, who's our, our representative from Afro-Caribbean Society, to introduce the society and explain a little further how this is going to go. Um, hi, I'd like to thank, first of all, the panelists for coming. Um, I've read a lot of your work. Um, I've also read um, uh, Florence's work as well, and it's been amazing. I think it really reflects, especially on these current times. And I think this is one of, probably one of the most important discussions we'll have this semester. So yeah, first of all, I'd like to just thank you on behalf of ACS um, for attending this um, panel. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to explain about um, ACS a little bit. So the African and Caribbean Society is one of the most prominent cultural societies in training. Um, our aim is kind of like to promote uh, African Caribbean um, culture and like provide a forum for discussion, a safe space really, and a place for people to learn and people to share and people to kind of gain insight to our experiences. Um, I think African, African Caribbean society is rich, it's diverse, um, and we give opportunities to students to explore our rich uh, culture uh, through various art forms such as dance, music, and literature. Um, yeah, so this is a collaboration with the His Society, and a little bit more on how this is going to go. So um, really, we just want to hear from you. Like, you are the talent, you are the voice you want to hear, and we want to hear your experiences. So we're going to start off with um, broad questions, really, just to kind of get us going, kind of, you know, see what you guys um, have done, like introduce your background and stuff. So I'd just like to start with um, asking if the panelists um, could introduce themselves. Um, I think, Gillian, you're on my screen, actually, so would you like to introduce yourself first? That's great. Uh, thank you both very much for the invitation to be part of this. And uh, I agree, it's a really important uh, contribution to getting the new university year started and raising important topics. Um, yeah, I'm Gillian Wiley. I work uh, in uh, the School of Religion. I teach on the master's programme in international peace studies. Um, and my kind of areas that I teach around are related to international migration uh, politics and also gender issues as they shape violence and peace. And I write and research in those areas. So thank you very much. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. Um, I think I can see uh, Dr. Evelyn Joseph there. Um, hi, my name is Evelyn Joseph. Um, I have many portfolios, but I have, I'm a career development consultant with the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, and then I well, taught, you know, last academic year in Trinity in um, the race, ethnicity and identity, the undergrad module, and then the MPhil in um, race and um, gender. So that was really interesting because it was a new module and just looking at the intersection. Um, and then I started the first Black Studies module in, in Ireland in UCD. So that's really, you know, one of the things I'm really excited about and proud about. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen your work and it's very, very wonderful. Um, I think I see um, Florence there as well. Would you like to, to introduce yourself? 
Um, hi, I'm Florence. So I am a third year nursing student in Trinity. There's not really much to say about me because my career hasn't started yet, but I'm just here to speak about the student aspect of race and relations on Trinity. So that's about it for me. Thank you. Florence is actually part of um, an article that was written and it was actually a very poignant article very important so yeah we love to have your insight and then lastly um claudia yeah hi everyone my name is claudia um and my background is in the arts and then i went on to study international relations and for the last number of years i have been speaking and delivering training on um, inclusion with a particular focus on anti-racism and I currently sit on the board of the Irish Network Against Racism. And um, yeah, very happy to be here and to join this conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Those are our wonderful, talented uh, panelists. Um, it's actually very, very wonderful to have you here. I know the virtual environment is kind of strange, but uh, we're glad that all of you can make it. Um, so maybe I think we're going to start with the broad questions, right? Yeah, I think we'll go into broad questions now for about 15 minutes. Okay, Grant. Okay, so I'm going to start with one question. This is for all the panelists. Um, in your own words, could each of you explain what the phrases racism, racial injustice, inequality, and Black Lives Matter mean to you? Um, you could describe it as though you explained the terms to someone you've never heard or met before. Anyone can take that question. Um, I can start. Well, um, if we do race 101, I think the simplest way, you know, sometimes we try and put it in, in complicated definitions, but I think just the basic thing is, is treating someone, race, you know, is we are all race. So if we start from that, that every one of us is raised, black, white, green, blue, all the colors in between, we are all raised. We all are part of this thing called the race. Unfortunately, when some people hear the notion or hear the word race, we think we mean black people, but race is everyone. So that's the first thing I would say about race. Um, so when we begin to look at racism, you know, and racial inequality, you know, race was created to separate some groups. Race was created to develop a racial hierarchy. Um, where some people are at the top and some people are at the bottom. So one of the things when I teach, I say race started from a bad place. There is nothing we can do to make that notion of race a good thing, the way it operates today, because it was created to perform a racial hierarchy. And so the existence of race makes racial inequality exist because race is used to say some groups are better than the other. Some groups deserve more than the other. And the minute you bring in that idea of better, when you bring in that idea of um, you, you give attributes, positive attributes to one and not to the other, you create inequality. So the way race has been created generates inequality. Inequality has an impact on people you know, both our health, emotional, but in addition to that, it stirs up, if you are the one experiencing that negativity, it stirs up a lot of anger, it stirs up hearts, it makes you second guess yourself, you're almost asking, is it me or is it you? <laughs> you know, you yeah, go to no, no. that system, you know, and all of that. And I think maybe one thing that I'm beginning to remind people, all of us who are alive today, is that race, and racism, we did not create it. Those of us who are alive today, we did not create it. You did not create it. Everyone listening to me did not create it, okay? So we inherited race, this notion. We inherited the racisms that come with it. However, we, what we do with this inheritance is all on us. So yes, it's an inheritance. We inherited racism, we inherited race, we inherited white supremacy, we inherited white privilege, you know, all of those things, you know. So your race, if you are at the top of the race, you enjoy privilege. If you are at the bottom, you enjoy disfavor or you get disfavor, you know. And so that inequality has an impact. 
we didn't create that, but what we do with it from today or from when we came alive is all on us. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. And um, can I ask about, um, what about the Black Lives Matter movement? What does that mean to you? I think Black Lives Matter, you know, um, is, is a fight. I know we're looking at the hashtag now, but this is not a fight that started today. It started from the enslavement of black bodies, you know, where, where enslaved people would resist, they would run away, they would burn down farms, or they would, you know, burn down animals or kill animals. You know, it, it, that, that, that resistance, you know, has been yeah. going on since. And so when we talk about the struggle, this Black Lives Matter is a continuation of the struggle that enslaved Black bodies have been um, fighting for many centuries. You know, the fight against scientific racism that looks at Black people and say, you are not human. You know, that uh, fight against the eugenics who looks at the size of people's heads or the skull to decide whether you are human. The fight against economics that looks at the color of a person's skin or, you know, the black blood that you might have to decide that you do not deserve to, to have management role or to be at the top or at the bottom you know, of the ladder. So that fight for our humanity, you know, to say that black people are human. So this Black Lives Matter is a continuation. It's not a new thing. So people should not see it as a new thing. It's a struggle. So, and we call that in, in black studies, in, in Afrocentricity, we call it the struggle for black humanity. And so that's what it is. Some people are tired, they're exhausted already. I'm saying, so you've only done Black Lives Matter for three months and you're tired. I'm 50 this year. So imagine I've done Black Lives Matter for 50 years of my life. So imagine those who are older than me, imagine those who've seen their parents die from that struggle and are still part of it. And you're tired already from three months. So really Black Lives Matter is saying is that humanity, we're asking people to care because the things you care about, you do something about it. And so people are outraged. You know, they're outraged, you know, by protest but they are not outraged that you can kneel on somebody's neck for four minutes and, and 50, 46 seconds, nine minutes and 46 seconds and, and kill somebody. We're not outraged. We're not outraged that, you know, we're afraid for our kids to go on the street because they could be racially profiled, not because they've done anything, but just because of how they look. They are not outraged, you know, that a president can look at a whole continent and call it a, an asshole. You know, like, you're not outraged. You know, so I'm like, be mindful, let's, let's look at the things that outrage people because then it tells us what you care about and the things that you don't care about. So that's what it is. It is a struggle for the humanity of black people. Thank you, thank you. I think everybody was enriched uh, with that answer. Um, to ask another member of the panel another question. Um, we'd like to know when and how to like your a career, maybe through your publications, through your overall work and experiences, did you come to realize the concept of racism or when did it become poignant to you? When did it really stand out? Um, this could refer to things like macroaggressions, um, full on racism, blatant racism. So just um, when do you feel like you truly grasped the concept? Um, may I? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Claire. Um, um, I don't think for me, I came to grasp the concept through my education or my work experience. I think for me, I have, I have, I came to grasp the, con the concept as a child. Um, so I, I suppose um, I was born in Kenya and I grew up in Kenya for, and I moved here when I was a teenager. So most of my um, formative years, if you like, were in a, in, in a Kenyan, a very African context and culture. My parents are Kenyan. So, um, but even there, I was very aware of my skin, the, you know, my family, my heritage, the fact that I had mixed ethnicity in my family, the fact that, you know, um, all of those uh, dynamics and how we were treated all within our family, in the wider uh, community. Um, and then when we moved to Ireland. So I think it's something that I sort of feel like um, I've grown with it, if you like, or I've grown up with it. I, I can't pinpoint a time, you know, academically or professionally where 
it dawned on me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think I would also kind of say, um, and uh, Dr. Ebrun, your description of, of everything you said, I agree with, and I just, I felt it this morning on a different level, so thank you. Um, I think sometimes what I, what I find from talking to people, that people seem to have this very um, <clears throat> singular, singular view of race, if I can call it that, particularly as so much of what we're consuming right now is quite American centric um, because the American situation is what is outraging every, uh, you know, what has ignited this outrage. And so there's this, um, there's this uh, thing that we're doing, particularly in Ireland, where we're sort of looking at it as that problem. And the, you know, this, I don't, I don't want to call it an inability because we have the inability. I don't know if it's a lack of, of, of willingness or what, but this block that we have to actually owning it in the Irish context, I think is really problematic. Um, you know, I think even, even as we talk about we're coming into Black History Month, I'm seeing so many people celebrated for, for the right reasons, you know, but I'm seeing a lot of people that are American and British being celebrated. And this year I'm taking a real look at what it means, what Black history means to me in Ireland, what Black Irish history means to me. Like I want to be hearing about not just the people that are well known, but the people, the Black people who've been living in Irish communities, they are part of history too, you know? And, and so, I mean, I think all of these things, all of these things serve to make us aware and keep us aware, but it, it's also, it's also, as you said, Dr. Erwin, it's also exhausting you know, because it feels like an ongoing thing. It feels like not only an ongoing learning, but an ongoing teaching that you have to keep doing. It feels like there's this responsibility and this weight that you have to keep explaining to people. Listen, race is a system of oppression. It wasn't, you know, as you said, it wasn't created by us. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum where one end is death and the other end is power, because that's how I see it. Even unconscious bias, if you think about it, it's power, you know? So, um, I don't know if I've answered your question. I think I've gone off on a, on a tangent, sorry. Uh, but yes, so yeah, I mean, that's the, that would be my view. No, it's, uh, yeah, you added value, don't, don't worry about it. Um, Listen, if I can just add to that, right? Yeah, I can I answer? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, so since I'm inside like the health side of things for me i see more health inequalities because like when we are taught as student nurses we learn about things that may like will affect the white body more than other people of color or black people like for example you learn about symptoms that would affect the that would affect black people more for example chicken pox or rashes that will appear on white skin but you do not know what it looks like on darker skin tones and to me that just shows a very big side of health inequality in Ireland because if let's say a black woman or an Indian woman presents with the same symptoms as the white woman, you won't know what to look for because you have not been taught that. So I would definitely need to fix the health inequality in Ireland um, so that people can get better treatment and people can be diagnosed quicker as well. So that would be what I see in my career in terms of like the inequality side of things. Um, just to so. ask another question there, how, how do you think that um, change can be brought about? Because the health sector is very, very uh, important. It's like the foundation of society. Mm. Um, there is actually a doctor. I think he is from America or the UK, but he has actually um, published a book showing what different things look like on darker skin. So I feel like if the Irish um, education system can implement that book into learning, that would be so much helpful because so many different races do come into the hospitals and they do have so, and they do show the same, they do have the same diseases as white people, but we just don't know what to look for. So if they do implement that book and add it to our learning, that would be so, so helpful for us so that we can treat people the same way that's that's what i think honestly your mutes
Can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes, sorry, can you hear me now? You're still mute. Volume is very low. Hello, hello. Can, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Nixon, sorry, are you cut? You're on mute, I think. <laughs> oh, are you back? Um, okay, while, while you get that sorted out, I just thought, Claudia, you made a really uh, an interesting point about that you kind of can't account for the, the lack of knowledge and the lack of like awareness and education when it comes to this like Black Lives Matter and these movements that are racially set centered. And I think that that kind of answered and in, like answered with kind of a I don't I'm not sure when it comes to our, our, our third broad question, which was really interesting. And I think I think what this panel aims to do is kind of see if it's if is it a root um, of, of the problem is that there's a lack of education when it comes to to black studies. And when there's a lack of education, I think there's a lack of, of motivation or, or care um, that is just not cultivated if you aren't learning about the struggles in a kind of like academic and structured way. And I think that leads us on nicely to um, to asking for an Ibon Joseph, if that's okay, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about the, the module content of your first Black Studies module in Ireland that you introduced in UCD, which was obviously a monumental moment within um, Irish history, I think, and in, in Irish education. And could you just tell us, uh, explain the necessary and uh, necessity as well for establishing these kinds of modules within education and especially third level education? Okay, thank you. I'm just conscious that Breed has not said anything, so I hope I'm not jumping in and taking a space that you're supposed to um, say uh, stuff. I, I, I'm the tech person. Yeah. Oh, you're the tech person. Okay, all <laughs> yeah, right. You, 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 okay. you, can see, you can see my worry about other people rather than minding my own stuff. But anyway, um, so Black Studies, one of the things, one of the reasons, you know, Black Studies was set up, not just in Ireland, or what even pushed me to want to set up Black Studies, was if we go back to the origin of Black Studies in the United States. So again, you know, we're connected to that history, you know, and, and you know, looking at that, you know, because the, one of the key things we understand about race is that, you know, until Black and white are in the spa same space, you actually don't see race you know, so it is the, it's the contact that comes together. And so when we look at in the United States, we have all of the contact between blackness and whiteness, you know, so it made the conflicts and the contact of, you know, of race become so obvious. You know, uh, um, it was Fanon that talks about it, that the black man does not, you know, see his difference unless, you know, is, in, is, you know, is reflected against the other. And so that that process even others us. So, but when we go back to the United States, you know, students began to, and it was not just students, but, you know, it was academic spaces that that argument came through because it had been happening in the community, in the society, but this black studies was like two, uh, to the academy and black students began to say look when we go to colleges you only tell us awful things about our history you only tell us about our struggles you only tell us about the deficit the things that are wrong you know with black people you don't tell us anything good and so they said we want to get a non-eurocentric view of our background and of our history Kataji Woodson wrote a book, it's called The Miseducation of the Negro, a powerful book, you know. And in the book, he, he reminds us that it is only the black person's education that starts with a deficit of himself. If you're a black person in the Western world, your education starts by teaching you about every other person, teaches you how your history, how your forefathers were discovered. Do you know? Teaches you about their slavery and their enslavement. It teaches you about, you know, awful things about it. It doesn't go back to tell us about the Mali Empire, the Bini Empire. It doesn't tell us about, you know, the, you know, the pyramids that were built until today. We cannot understand the, you know, the level of, of you know, skill that it took to do that. It doesn't tell us that, you know, black people were enslaved because they actually had skills. They were they were great farmers, they were great headsmen, they were great hunters, you know, and they were physically strong. It doesn't tell you good things. It actually just tells you horrible things. So black studies really by, is a way of 
bypassing, you know, some of the negativity that is the start of Black history and takes you back, takes you back to language, what language means, how language has grown, you know, in Africa. It tells you about their history, about their wealth, about the science, you know, science that originated from African history that we have taken in the Western world and we have maybe improved and used on, but it gives you a different perspective. You know, so when Kataji Wilson talks about it as the miseducation of the Negro, when in my studies, I actually realized that actually, no, it's not just the Negro mind that is miseducated. The white mind is miseducated as well. Because if we do not teach you a complete history, you will grow up to become a white supremacist. Even if you don't wear a hood and you're a KKK, no, you start thinking that my race is superior. And that's where, you know, all of these stereotypes, that's where it comes from, you know, because you don't go into your history. All the talks I'm giving in this month of October, you know, is Black History Month. So all the talks I'm giving, I'm actually talking about why history, why we need to understand history to be able to challenge uh, um, racism. You cannot stop being a racist. You cannot stop having racist ideas or racist policies if you do not understand the history of the people. It, it's not going to everything you will do will be performative. So the first minute you come into contact with difference, all the implicit bias in you will come up, you know, and rear its ugly head, you know. So it is the history, when you go back into the real history, that helps to challenge the stereotypes, you know, and the wrong learning, you know, that we've had. So yes, we need our minds, both, you know, black and white to be re-educated. Last thing I would say is that black studies, and black history is not to eradicate or to erase white studies or white history. No, it is to complement it. It's to make sure, like we have day and night, is to make sure that we can see the world from all perspectives. And so that we are then able to accept people. So, you, you know, that's just really what it is. That's really interesting and, and very powerful. And I completely agree that it's so, so imperative that we implement these kinds of studies into all university education. And um, I just was wondering when you were, you know, began this initiative to set up uh, this Black Studies module, and um, just kind of thinking about the fact that over the summer, lots of students in Trinity signed a petition to get a Black Studies module um, implemented and established within Trinity. Did you experience any pushback? Was anyone against the initiative? Was it difficult to, to gain support from UCD to, to then um, establish this? I think it was impossible to get, <laughs> and I still think it's still close to impossible now because the only way I could do that was because I had an income from somewhere else. I mean, I was any less than flipping burgers for teaching that module. If I did not have a full-time job in the Royal College of Surgeons, so I was augment or I was supplementing that job. Do you understand? Yeah. And so you 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 look at that. That's the only way. Honestly, you know, I <laughs> it was feeding burgers in McDonald's. I would have been any more than I earned teaching that module. But it was so important to me. I was willing to do it for free. Do you know what I mean? It was just, it needed to be done. But, you know, you know, I was fortunate that I have industry experience as a career development consultant. So I have a full-time job in the Royal College of Surgeons. So that, that allows me, freed me up to, but people who don't have that, they can't do it, yeah. you know? So, so there's a lot of pushback. And, and I think the thing is, the pushback is not very overt. It is very subtle. And that pushback comes in silence. You're ignored, you're silenced, there is no support. Like I cannot, that's a, that's a whole article and a whole book I need to write on my experience in Irish Academy. Like it is a nightmare. I do not know how black scholars can survive in the Irish Academy as we have it today. All the people I know, most of them who are homegrown, we've had to migrate out of the academy and we are supporting our academic work with having a life outside of that. And the impact of it is that I am, like my head is exploding because I'm having to do a whole full-time job and then teach in three different colleges at the same time. It's exhausting, you know? So, wow. so the way, so the pushback it's not, a, it's not very overt, it's very subtle. You know, you get no support. All my guest lecturers, in, in, when I, the guest lecturers, I paid them for money that was already taxed. They had already taxed me 
So I use that tax money to pay my guest lecturer. That is wrong on every level, every level. I mean, like every level. But for me, I could not be part of the system that abuses, you know, uh, uh, guest lecturers coming in. Do you know? So I paid them from money that was already taxed. So the pushback is very silent. But, but like in the United States, it was students who cried out for it. And I think that our students, you are being done a disservice if you do not have a strong um, proper grasp of this because you will grow up, you will come out into the system and you will be the next set of racist, the next set of white supremacists. You will be the one trying to go and do an implicit bias training. And it makes no difference because you sit down in that one hour chair, you get up after the one hour, you're still the racist you were when you sat in there because these ideas are deep seated and we need to, you know, you need to be immersed in it. I know it's only 12 weeks, but if you listen to one of the videos of my students from the first year, it was, I mean, like it transformed their, their ideas of themselves, you know, their identity. They were no longer, you know, that shaming that comes. And even the white students were so, you know, yeah, it, it, it does, you know, I think, I think it's just something that all schools, all colleges should have, and there should be a lot of support for it. I completely agree and I think that is a really good case for why we, the students need to become angry and, and really push colleges to to implement these kinds of uh, um, black studies modules specifically and I think is there a lack of care there is that perhaps because there's no black studies education even before that so I think coming on from that you know there's no guarantee that students will want to do this module even if it's implemented and I think coming on from that um, uh, Claudia, um, do you believe that secondary schools can can introduce an element of, of racial education uh, into a curriculum that's currently devoid of the subject and perhaps in, in, improve inclusion and diversity in schools overall? A hundred percent. I think they can. I think they should. I think the responsibility, uh, there is there is a responsibility on the Department of Education and those who are preparing curriculums to do so. As somebody who came through the um, Irish education system myself, I can tell you as, as a person of colour who was coming through this education system that there was never any um, discussion or learning or acknowledgement of race or ethnicity or anything like that. Um, you know, yes, we studied of mice and men. Yes, we studied to kill a mockingbird. Yes, the N word was mentioned in class. And, you know, there was never even how it was treated, how it was unpacked was just breezed over. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I want to take this question along with a surprising question that I've just seen come up in the chat there from somebody wondering, is there racism in Ireland? Not just in education, but in general. So the reason I say that is a surprising question uh, ties very nicely into this. The very, the very fact that you know, there are people out there who still think there isn't racism in Ireland is a case for why we need to be talking about it younger in primary schools, I would argue, not just secondary schools. To answer that question, yes, there is racism in Ireland. Um, a simple Google search will tell you that. If you look at the INAR website, www.einar.ie, um, there are reports there going back several years that are prepared from the data that is pulled from the iReport platform. So anybody who may not have heard of the iReport platform, it's a website and an app, www.ireport.com, and it's the only online racist reporting platform that exists in Ireland at the moment. So we get statistics from that, you know, two or three times a year, and all the statistics relate to incidents that happen in Ireland, in the workplace, on the street, in pubs, restaurants, clubs, you know, education, uh, university schools, everywhere. Um, and, and really, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to, to keep, um, to keep having these conversations when there isn't that basic information there or education, if you like, for people to access. So if we're not providing that at schools, if, I mean, as Dr. Ebun, as you said, there should be black studies everywhere. Like, you know, there shouldn't be the one black studies course. Um, you know, like it needs to be something that people are, are coming into contact with as easily as they're coming into 
learning about other histories. I did the Leaving Search in Ireland and I, you know, could wax lyrical about American history because that's what I, that's what we were being taught and Irish history, of course. You know, but there was nothing, there was no acknowledgement there of any kind of um, African history unless you were talking about colonialism and even that was very little. So I think there's definitely, um, yes, it can be done, but I'd go further to say that there is an onus. There's actually an onus on the people who are on educators to make sure it's done. And, and there's a little bit of, you know, uh, there's a little bit of action or not a little bit, but action that needs to be taken by educators as well, as opposed to waiting for uh, the top down approach or the people who are making the decisions and developing the curriculum. I think teachers and students, educators in general have a lot of power, um, but we, maybe we just don't know it yet. Or maybe we don't fully realize how much power we have, particularly when I'm talking about primary and secondary level. Yeah. So I completely agree. I think it's uh, students need to put pressure on these schools as well. If you, if there are, there are plenty of students listening to this and uh, if you have siblings perhaps still in secondary school, there need to be, I think anyway, there need to be black student unions set up. There need to be, there needs to be like a quota for representation on student councils. There needs to be some kind of like system in place that gives support to um, a BIPOC uh, members of schools so that and then also education so that when students go into to second level or into third level they want to learn more about you know in an academic sense and write academically about black studies and black struggles in general and um, so I absolutely agree thank you so much for that that answer and um, I just want to to move on to Florence for the, the last question of this segment and then I'll, I'll go on to you Gillian part this is Pardon me for not um, um, asking something yet, but we'll, we'll get on to you in a moment. Um, but just for you, Florence, um, and could I just ask you um, to give maybe a, a, just a rundown of your personal experience in education, so secondary school and, and your personal experience on, on campus in Kennedy. Has this been a way of welcoming what ways can, can, be can the institution improve? Well, on campus, on Trinity campus, it's not too bad. It's just more externally when we go out on placement. It's there, we can't really control it because the racism comes mainly from patients. The thing that I think Trinity can, what Trinity can do to improve the racism would be teach us how to deal with the racism, not just tell us to like brush it over our shoulders and just ignore it. You need to actually teach us how to deal with it because coming into work at Sunday in the morning, doing an eight, doing a twelve-hour shift, having to listen to that, having some patients that don't want you to touch them because of the color of their skin, or they want someone else to look after them because they just don't like the color of their skin. Help us deal with that, and don't tell us to brush it off. Like there should be classes on how um, student nurses or student pharmacists or doctors can deal with racism, and we need the skills because like the way you deal with racism on a regular day you cannot bring that into clinical practice so they need to teach us how to do with it on clinical practice and i feel like our perceptors on placement need to do more to protect us and help us and like help us deal with the racism rather than say oh this person just has dementia it's it's not their fault just let it go they need to do more in my opinion but on campus itself trinity is okay it's just when you go on placement that things aren't so great but you asked about secondary school my secondary school was it was okay it was racially diverse there was a few slight bits of racial tensions between black students and some teachers that was not dealt with properly in my opinion but um hopefully by now they've seen the error of their ways and they've improved but when i was in secondary school we had teachers splitting up um the black students because they felt intimidated my own brother and his friends were called a gang by the teachers take their pictures were taken because they were just a group of um, black people, even though on the other side, you had an even bigger group of white boys, but the teachers never felt intimidated. So, so that's how my secondary school was like anyways. So I'm hoping by now they would have with the issues and they would have found a way to actually reach out to the black students rather than act the way they did back then, if that makes sense. Yeah, I completely agree. 
So. Ned, your mic is really low. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I, I'll, I might just speak louder. Is that okay for everyone? Sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you for, uh, for letting me know, Dr. Joseph. Um, I think perhaps unconscious bias training plays a role in, in those situations for both teachers and for, for other students. Um, and I'd love to ask a question about it, but I think I, I'm going to move on to kind of our, our second category, the urgency of improving access to third level education for um, asylum seekers and kind of the sanctuary program as, a, as a, an extension of that, because I think you know, even if students get into third level education, there's that like, and we get, uh, you know, a black studies module implemented, even if we have the best education ever, if people can't, if, if asylum seekers and refugees are, are bar barriers and aren't allowed into a uh, third level education, then it doesn't matter at all. So it's almost like broadening the conversation. So I just want to ask um, uh, Gillian, your specialism lies in, in like politics of international migration. And I, as far as I know, you're part of a team who are working towards making Trinity a university of a sanctuary. And I was just wondering if you could tell us about this initiative and explain why it's so imperative. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Maeve. And it's been brilliant listening to everybody uh, so far and very uh, challenging and inspiring. Um, I think I'd just say before I move on to the sanctuary issue that um, I think we are waking up in the college uh, in Trinity to the lacunas in our curricula and I see on the chat Catherine's written in about the kind of western centric perspectives that uh, dominate in philosophy, social science, my own background area of international politics I would say a very male dominated and uh, Eurocentric Western American centric views of the world of what I grew up on in my studies. Uh, I'm 52 uh, Eben, so I know, I know how it feels. Um, so, um, but now in Trinity, thanks very much as well to the kind of social change around us and, and movements like Black Lives Matter and its ramifications in Ireland. We move towards a more, uh, a project in Trinity around inclusive curriculum that is getting underway. Um, led in our new um, equality, diversity, inclusion unit um, and um, members of the college community, staff, students and others are going to be part of looking at the curriculum um, in the coming year, looking at the ways in which it is, um, you know, uh, blind to certain lived experiences, uh, privileges, certain worldviews and asking ourselves to rethink uh, those kind of things along the lines that uh, Claudia Florence and Ibn have, have raised in their contributions this morning. So um, I think, you know, we'll be glad to have student interest and support uh, for that initiative in college in the coming year. Um, but you asked me about um, the other initiative that I, I'm aware I'm part of, uh, which is the the University of Sanctuary movement, um, which uh, exists already in many other universities uh, in Ireland and uh, institutes of technology as well. Um, the Sanctuary University of Sanctuary is part of a broader uh, sanctuaries, uh, places of sanctuaries movement uh, that tries to create cultures of welcome and inclusion. Um, it could be in public institutions, religious institutions, um, or places at schools. Uh, there's a school of sanctuary movement as well, which would very much tally with what Claudia was arguing for um, earlier. Um, and, um, or talk to Florence's school experiences as well. Uh, but anyway, University of Sanctuary is the idea that universities should be places of welcome and inclusion um, and must kind of adhere to principles like a, an inclusive approach to curriculum, um, um, finding ways to enable participation of uh, particularly asylum seekers and refugees uh, in the sanctuary movement um, and building a network uh, with other uh, similar institutions and sharing these ideas and work uh, in the university sector more broadly. Um, it's a work in progress always. Uh, we know we're coming from a position where this has to be pushed and built. Um, so Sanctuary is an ongoing long-term project for the college. But for asylum seekers and refugees to come to more specifically your question, um, access to third level education is extremely challenging, uh, particularly for people in the asylum system because they are not treated as uh, 
as local students, they're treated as international students. So even if a, a young person has done their education in an Irish secondary school um, and come through with the Leaving Cert, they won't be able to progress uh, to university or, uh, or an IT um, in the same way as the, the kids they've come through school with uh, because they are um, faced with enormous fees. So sanctuary scholarships exist in many universities now. Um, Dublin City University was the first. Uh, UCD is a very uh, generous uh, scholarship provider. And Trinity, we have for the last two years now, we have um, Asylum Seeker Access Programme, which um, gives some uh, four scholarships each year for um, asylum seeking students. And hopefully we'll uh, continue to grow that. Um, but it's important we also try to work on the structural issues, as um, Ebun uh, mentioned right at the start, you know, it's, there's an unfairness built into the system uh, whereby people are classified in this way in the first place, uh, making access so difficult. So individual universities can help by giving these kinds of scholarships, but we also need to look at the structural issues that uh, prevent people from accessing. Absolutely, I completely agree. And I think just for the last conversation that won't be from uh, the chat, just to finish up, you were mentioning about kind of asylum seekers being housed. And I think that alludes to the direct provisions uh, centres and I I'm all for abolishing them. I think they're a disgrace. Um, and that that just is, a, is because of all the human rights abuses and concerns. And um, like, you know, just asylum mm -hmm. seekers are not treated like, like people in this country. And that's a massive issue. And it, it's particularly eye opening when we consider the nationalist rhetoric that that promises that Ireland is this is this welcoming country. But I think that this has shown that it's not necessarily like that when actually anyone who is different is excluded and oppressed in some kind of way. And it just shows that I think it's really important that we change it at the roots, which is why education is is the topic for this discussion. But I just mm -hmm. um, if you could, um, for the last question, kind of explain why it's so necessary that we we change how we house uh, long term asylum seekers within Ireland and and kind of um, also perhaps explain some ways that this could this could be done alternatives mm -hmm. to the direct provision, if that's OK, Gillian. Yeah, I, I'll try. It's not my specialist area, but uh, certainly we what we have is a system where people are very many of the people in the listening into this will know this well from uh, the coverage the topic receives. But people in uh, a claiming asylum in Ireland are mainly uh, they're housed in direct provision and they end up there for a very, very long time uh, because asylum processes uh, work terribly slowly. Uh, unacceptably slowly uh, in the Irish system and um, people are stuck in this uh, shared accommodation um, with uh, families living in uh, shared accommodation rooms not being able to cook etc. Despite some reforms to the system it's still uh, very difficult and certainly we've seen that particularly during coronavirus uh, where you know the the inhumanity of the the, the living conditions has has come to the fore with outbreaks of COVID because people are sharing this type of uh, accommodation. So there's a general sense that it's it, it's a failing system. Uh, alternatives um, would perhaps be to um, look at um, changing the ways in which this uh, or changing who, who's in control here. Um, the Department of Justice control the lives of asylum seekers um, and that's maybe not uh, they're not specialists in, in terms of how people are housed um, or accommodation, uh, housing and accommodation uh, more effectively can be managed and run by specialists in that area, be that housing associations um, or um, social housing, uh, non-governmental organisations and so on. People should be able to live in, uh, in, in separate accommodation in, in uh, housing of their own um, and be properly living and um, another issue is is the right to work. Um, it, there is a, a limited right to work for asylum seekers uh, but many people can't avail of it because of various restrictions on it and if people don't have access to it fun to work they can't uh, earn money to 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 have accommodation outside of the the system so it's part of a bigger issue about the social and economic rights of asylum seekers as well as the immediate issue of uh, where people are living um this kind of needs a holistic um overview that that takes it away from purely a kind of management of people's 
claims to access uh, uh, justice through the Justice Department, but the wider social and economic um, and housing context people live in. I think those are some really good suggestions for, for alternatives and new ways we could, we could handle asylum seekers in this country. And I think the main thing to take away from all of your incredible contributions is that education is a transformative tool and it changes what people feel and think and how people interact with one another. And I think um, all of the personal experiences that we've heard just show that you become so much more aware um, both as a person of colour and a, a black person and when you're a, a white person who who's attempting to support you have to become aware of the the extent of the struggle that you're try, trying to support so um just um as a last question from the audience um I think Catherine unless someone answered this am I wrong um just about uh, is asking about um experiencing a really eurocentric education that whenever um, she brings up African uh, philosophy, it's brushed off as not even existing or it is ex extremely minimised. How can Hanze, as a student, push for a wider education in an area that seems to be heavily under-researched and underappreciated? So would one of our panellists like to take that question to finish us off? I, I think that, you know, again, students, you know, like you, you need to ask for what you need for your education to be complete. You know, the biggest weapon um, that racism uses is denial, is a shut up experience. It pushes back, it resists you. It, you know, it, it stays silent to you. And so it, it overlooks, it tries to ignore. So it's a powerful tool, but that's how it does. So it minimizes, it makes, it makes what you're doing and what you're trying to say seem insignificant you know, and it makes you begin to question and to second guess yourself. So that is a tool, you know, it's a deliberate tool. It's not ignorance. You know, racism is not ignorance. You know, it, it's not ignorance. It's a system of operation, you know, and we've been taught, you know, we've learned, we've seen it has been modeled for us, you know, how to operate, you know. So I, I think that students can begin to ask. So if you go and all, all the, your reading list, everybody on your reading list is white, your class rep, you know, it's the same way that a class rep is there. A class rep, you know, would ask, you know, if the hours are bad. So if the reading list is bad, let the class rep, you know, say, you know, would appreciate a little bit more. Do you know, it doesn't have to always be a protest. You can have a conversation, you know, with, with the, you know, with the, with your, particularly in the, in the kind of 2020 that we have now. Medicine students, you should not have examples that are all white, you know, because science did not just start from whiteness. Science started from Africa, you know, so we should, we should go back to that so that when you're being taught, you know, so let them use examples so you can ask for that, you know, because when you remember that our silence, so even as students, as academics, as scholars, your silence is saying something, you know, your silence is causing harm, you know, so you can't be silent, you know, as student because your silence is taken as consent, you know, and it's your education, you're paying for it, you're using your time, you know, and as educators, we have a massive part to play. And I, and I know, you know, Gillian, you talked about, you know, the, you know, looking at the curriculum, I'm like, but if it is the same people who produce the curriculum that we have looking at it, what's going to be different? That's the cynic in me anyway, you know, <laughs> you know, so that's the question I'm asking. I'm like, okay, it's still a Eurocentric whole, the team is still fully Eurocentric. So, you know, you're not going to be talking of enslaved people unless you've attended a black studies course when we've told you that don't say slaves, say enslaved, you know, so you, you're not going to be able to talk about, you know, like, you know, there's some things, you know, so, so the team, so key things that will need to happen in the academy, we need to look at the experiences of, you know, people, not just black students, our traveler students, somebody asked a question about the Roma community, you know, our Roma students, you know, look at what we've done for COVID. You understand? Look at what we've done for COVID. We've taken education out from the schools into your homes. So if you say the traveler students did not come into schools, what have we put in place as a nation to take the education to them? Because we didn't care, that's why. You know, so if you say the Roma students, so have we made our education accessible to them? But rather, what, what do we keep trying to do? Force people into the system that we've put in place. So that it's a, it's a, it's a crisis of care. 
That's what we are having, you know? So we need to look at, you know, who has access, who are the furthest left behind. We need to look at the pipeline. I hear so many black students who get, you know, kicked out of school colleges, you know, for different reasons. I get all the complaints all the time. So we need to look at those things. Right now we're talking about, you know, data, you know, for staff, you know, and that's, I think so it's going to become mandatory, you know, from December that we, you know, we show the, you know, the demographics. If you look at the total number of black scholars who are trained in Ireland to doctorate level, and then you look at the fact that we only have one, one in the whole of Ireland, one fully employed professor that is black in the whole of Ireland. Check how many years, how many black scholars are graduating as PhD students from Ireland. That is a shame. So we need to monitor all of these things because if the students don't see even blackness or Roma or traveler or all of these represented, you know, then in their, in their curriculum, they would have, they won't even have the voice to challenge it because we've normalized it. You know, so it, it's in those kind of things that gives people permission. Look at why we have so many people young people speaking out now. Because at the death of George Floyd, the whole world began to speak. And the more people were speaking, it's like it released all our voices, all the young voices. Many people became, that story, stories are powerful. In critical race theory, we do storytelling. Storytelling emboldens others to tell stories. Do you understand? So that's what the killing, the public killing of George Floyd, it actually emboldened other people, black and white, to tell stories of racism. And that's why they, I think, you know, that's why there's such a, a, a you know strong you know um, pool so yes so let's let's you know you know ask just ask you don't have to fight you don't have to protest just ask sometimes we don't have because we don't ask so, so let's keep asking particularly as students you know I might not be able to ask as a black academic but you know as the students they will listen to you I completely agree and I, I actually I'm, I'm shocked to, to learn that it was so difficult for you to to set up the black studies module and that, that you know black academics can't work and be paid a fair wage and you know contribute to this discourse because i think that's the root of the problem and i i just hope that can be changed and um, through discussions like this and raising awareness and uh, you know systemic changes as well that we can make and um, and i i really really appreciate your contribution and um, all of you have been so so helpful and I, I feel very inspired. I feel like I'm going to sit down and do some thinking um, for the rest of the day. It, it was a very, very important discussion to me personally. And I'd just like to say thank you uh, from all of us at the HIST, um, from me as the organizer of Freshers Week. I think this is a, a, a high point, a massive high point during the week for me. And um, uh, from everyone at um, Afro-Caribbean Society, um, myself and Nixon have been working very closely to, to, to cultivate a good list of questions. And I think it really went so well. And also panelists. Um, so I think we've, we've actually done an, an, an amazing job and a great collaboration. Um, if Nixon is still there to, to, to speak on anything. Potentially. Um, it's okay if not. Um, sorry, sorry. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry for the technical issues earlier and then there were some noise distractions behind me. But yeah, um, this discussion has been very, very enriching. I'd like to thank all the panelists that came and made today like a really amazing day. This is actually one of the most amazing panels I've ever attended. All of you, like, it's very, very clear that everyone is very, very involved in what they do, very, very passionate. So, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone. And I'd like to thank the His Society for making this happen as well. I'd like to thank the Africa Caribbean Society for also making this happen. Um, I really, I think this was so important. And I'd like to thank any, everyone who came. And I'd just like to say, uh, just lastly, um, the HIST are, have set up a anti-racism racism working group and the deadline to actually sign up to be part of this working group is tonight. And um, so if you, if, if anyone's interested in, in being involved in, in another kind of reform and change within Trinity College Dublin, that's that's something potentially you might be interested in. Um, and you can just go to the HIST um, his page to be involved or look for the sign up form there and um, so thank you so much to everyone I think we'll we'll leave it there and um, we had absolutely amazing and um, engagement participation from everyone who came and um, thank you so much for your questions and I'd really like to extend my massive thanks just one last time to Claudia and um, Dr Joseph Florence and Gillian it's really been so 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 wonderful so um, thank you to all of you and I'll be sending you a, a massive email with all my thanks later as well um, and thank you Hopefully we can do something like Thank this. You, Thank you, Maeve and Nixon. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, this Bob has been amazing. Florence, Nixon, Wade, William. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.